In Jazz Age America, speakeasies in an illicit market thrived even as the nation banned alcohol. By the end of Prohibition, gangster Al Capone became almost synonymous with bootlegging. This is violating the law to supply the thirsty masses. But before the rise and fall of Capone, another child of immigrants from Chicago had established a nationwide bootlegging network and evaded the law. The exploits of George Remus, the king of the bootleggers, are history that deserve to be remembered. Chicago criminal defense lawyer George Remus found himself representing small-time bootleggers as Prohibition began in 1920s America. To better assist those clients, he read the Volstead Act, the law implementing Prohibition. The Volstead Act spelled out which alcoholic beverages were banned from sale. Looking over the new legislation with a lawyer's eye, Remus noted a loophole. The medicinal use of whiskey was excluded from the act. There were other exceptions that had to be negotiated, such as the religious use of wine, but the medicinal whiskey loophole intrigued the former pharmacist. Born in 1874 and coming to America as a child, he had a successful career in Chicago. At first he had worked as a pharmacist, getting his license at 19, buying the pharmacy from his uncle at 21. He attended DePaul University College of Law, became an attorney in 1904, specialized in criminal defense, and became quite famous. He used his pharmacy background to get a client off on a murder charge. The client had been accused of poisoning the victim, and in a dramatic trial moment, Remus drank a vial of the alleged poison to demonstrate that it was not fatal. He didn't mention that he had swallowed the antidote right before. Remus noticed that his bootlegging clients were getting quite rich off of their operation of producing and distributing illegal beverages. Instead of letting them be the only ones to profit, he decided to turn to a life of crime and use his knowledge of the law to avoid prosecution. Remus divorced his wife of over 20 years in Chicago and relocated with his girlfriend, Imogene Holmes, to Cincinnati, Ohio, where nearly all of America's whiskey distilleries were within a 300-mile radius. From this strategic position, he began buying up the distilleries to implement his plan to exploit the loophole of the Volstead Act. He married his girlfriend in Newport, Kentucky in June 1920 and, crucially, put his new Ohio home in her name. Imogene's daughter, Ruth, lived with them, but he left his own daughter, Ramola, behind in Chicago. Part of his plan to exploit the medicinal loophole was to buy up pharmacies as well as distilleries so they could sell bonded liquor under government licenses. His employees would then hijack his liquor from storage so they could sell it illegally. He even started a trucking company so his network could have a national reach. In Cincinnati alone, he employed over 3,000 people. Many had lost jobs with prohibition and viewed it as an unfair law. Remus became a folk hero of sorts because Prohibition was unpopular and he was seen as providing the supply for the high demand for alcohol. He once said, anyone who is in possession of an ounce of whiskey is a bootlegger. With the help of his trusted subordinates, he made $40 million in three years. They entertained many guests in their lavish mansion and they were known as great, maybe even profligate hosts. For New Year's Eve, 1922, they had a party that boasted some of the finest families in town. As gifts, Remus and Imogene gave to all the men diamond stick pins, and to their wives, they gave automobiles. Throughout the early 1920s, Remus became known as the king of the bootleggers, with the assistance of corrupt government officials whom he had bought off. He paid prohibition agents to not raid his operations, and bought extra government licenses to sell medicinal liquor. Even the United States Department of Justice was not immune from his corruption. However, Remus was not able to evade justice forever. Federal agents who were not paid off discovered his operations and he was caught. In 1925, he was indicted for thousands of Volstead Act violations. Pending criminal charges did not prevent Remus from continuing to engage in bootlegging. His network tipped him off to an opportunity in St. Louis and he took a trip while under indictment to the Mississippi River town. The Jack Daniels distillery was ripe for siphoning off whiskey and moving it in a fashion that he had used in Cincinnati. He agreed to participate in the scheme, staying at the Chase Park Plaza Hotel. Federal agents were on his trail, so he tried to be discreet. But his partners in the St. Louis adventure were not as careful as he was. Instead of waiting to siphon off whiskey gradually and move it under the noses of Prohibition agents, they moved it all at once, quickly caught, and Remus lost money on the scheme. He went to trial, and his friend in the Attorney General's office, Jess Smith, promised him he would not be convicted. Smith had accepted Remus's bribes, but however, the jury convicted him. Smith then promised that his conviction would not be upheld on appeal. It was. Smith promised a presidential pardon or Supreme Court victory if Remus paid him more money. Remus realized he was being played and quit paying, accepting his fate as a federal prisoner. 
Smith later committed suicide when his corrupt activities were discovered. Some, however, believed he was murdered for what he knew about the extent of official corruption surrounding prohibition. The person whose job it was to enforce the Volstead Act was Mabel Willebrandt, an attorney from Los Angeles who began her career defending prostitutes. She joined the Justice Department as an assistant attorney general. During Prohibition, she was head of the unit in charge of prosecuting bootleggers. Her job was made more difficult by corrupt agents and elite defiance of the law. In need of money, Remus pled with Imogene to sign over the house to him, but she refused. Remus had made millions of dollars from his bootlegging schemes, but he could not get the well from his house. He was sent to prison in Atlanta, and while there, he met and befriended Franklin Dodge. Dodge was actually a federal agent in prison undercover trying to bust a bootlegging ring. Remus, though, confided in him that Imogene had control over his vast estate. Armed with this information, Dodge sought out Imogene after resigning his job. Responding to his affections, Imogene started a relationship with him while Remus was in prison. Dodge and Imogene sold off Remus's distilleries and his property, pocketing the money for themselves. Remus, meanwhile, turned into a witness for the state and testified against other bootleggers, providing key evidence in an Indianapolis case. While there, a hitman tried to make an attempt on his life, but failed, partially because a reporter from St. Louis had tipped off police after overhearing it. Imogene and Dodge were rumored to be behind the attempt. Imogene and Dodge also attempted to have Remus deported, reporting to authorities that he did not have naturalization paperwork. His parents were Germans who immigrated to the United States. Remus was able to defeat the deportation attempt. In 1927, with Remus still in prison, Imogene filed for divorce and refused to give him any of his own money. Remus was relieved from prison only to face his divorce case. He remained haunted by Imogene and Dodge running off with his money. He chased him across the country, but they were always a step ahead of him, and he could not find out what they did with his estate. Not sleeping and overcome with thoughts of his wife cheating on him with another man, Remus shot her on the way to court for a hearing. He had his driver chase the car she was in and drive it off the road. He jumped out and shot her in the abdomen while onlookers watched. Imogene was taken to the hospital, but succumbed to her injuries. Remus was arrested for murder. The prosecutor was Charles Felth Taft II, son of Supreme Court Justice and former President William Howard Taft. Remus decided to represent himself. Remembering an old case in Chicago, Remus pled not guilty by reason of temporary insanity. He brought in Clarence Darrow, an old friend from his Chicago days, to testify about his character. Others testified to his state of mind in the days before the murder. The jury debated only 19 minutes and acquitted him. After winning, he took photos with the jury. The judge and reporters covering the trial were disgusted with the jury's behavior. One reporter likened it to the ending of the new play Chicago, where the murderesses, having been acquitted of their murder charges, became celebrities. The Cincinnati Post said, The Chicago bootlegger gets a Chicago verdict. Prosecutors then attempted to have him committed to an insane asylum, however they were prevented from doing so because of their previous claim that he was not insane. Remus moved across the Ohio River to Covington, Kentucky. He remarried, this time to his longtime secretary, Blanche Watson. He ran a small consulting firm before having a stroke in 1950. He died in 1952 after two years of living under a nurse's care. He's buried in Falmouth, Kentucky. Many believe Remus's life was F. Scott Fitzgerald's inspiration for The Great Gatsby. It is rumored that they met while Fitzgerald was stationed in Kentucky, but that is doubtful. However, by the time Fitzgerald began to write The Great Gatsby, Remus was well known. The similarities are conspicuous. Both owned a chain of pharmacies, both threw lavish parties, both wanted elite acceptance, and both were in love with a woman who didn't necessarily return their affections. Willebrandt pioneered the idea of using tax law to prosecute bootleggers. Her theory was confirmed and was successfully used against Al Capone. She left the Justice Department after believing that President Hoover would elevate her to Attorney General and being disappointed that she was denied that opportunity upon his election. She had campaigned for him, and candidate Al Smith nicknamed her Prohibition Portia. She had a successful career in the private sector, pioneering aviation law and radio law. She died in 1963 in California. Al Capone and his gang occupy a large portion of the American mythology regarding bootlegging. But before his gang of bootleggers and gangland enforcers, there was another Chicagoan who was supplying the people's thirst. Capone was once famously quoted as saying, I'm like any other man. All I do is supply a demand. George Remus, the forgotten king of the bootleggers, would agree.
I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.